Good morning, everyone. I'm Stephanie Maselli. I'm a media officer with the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Thank you all for joining us today for a webinar for the recently released report, Traumatic Brain Injury, a Roadmap for Accelerating Progress. To read the full report, you can visit nationalacademies.org slash TBI progress. Again, that's nationalacademies.org slash TBI progress, all one word. The slides and a recording of this webinar will be available on that page as well. And you can follow the social media conversation at hashtag progress in TBI. We also have a JAMA Viewpoint article that is coming out today if you're so compelled to read that too. And for those of you who are not familiar with the US National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine, we are private nonprofit institutions that provide independent objective analysis and advice to the US to solve complex problems and inform public policy decisions related to science, technology, and medicine. For each requested study, our committee members are chosen for their expertise and experience, and they serve pro bono to carry out the study statement of task. The reports that result from the study represent the consensus view of the entire committee, and our reports must undergo external peer review before they are released, as did this report. We have with us here today several members of the committee to discuss the report, and we'll first start off with an overview, then we'll open it up for audience Q&A. And before we delve into their presentation, I have just a few reminders for you. This webinar will last one hour. We'll start with that presentation summarizing the report. Then we'll open it up to your questions and you can simply click the Q&A button on the bottom of your screen if you want to submit a question. If you have any technical issues during this webinar, you can contact Zoom Technical Support at 1-888-799-9666 and select option two. And now I'd like to introduce you to the members of the committee that wrote the report who are here with us today. During the first half of the webinar, you'll be hearing from our committee chair, Donald Berwick, who is President Emeritus and Senior Fellow at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement and a former CMS Administrator. And then during the Q&A, you'll be hearing from other committee members who will be joining in. Uh, we have Jennifer Bogner, who is a professor at the department uh, in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at Ohio State University. We have Frederick Corley, who's an associate professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine at the University of Michigan. We have Jeffrey Manley, who is Margaret Liu Endowed Professor in Traumatic Brain Injury and Professor and Vice Chairman of Neurological Surgery, a co-director of the Brain and Spinal Injury Center at the University of California, San Francisco, and Chief of Neurosurgery at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital. We have Korean Peak Asa, who is Vice Chancellor for Research at the University of California, San Diego. And we have Eric Schumacher, who is retired Lieutenant General and a former Army Surgeon General. And now with that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Berwick, who will kick off the presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Stephanie. Let me make sure you can hear me okay. Great. Let me thank uh, all of you uh, participants for spending your valuable time with us. We're really excited to be releasing our report today. I want to thank my uh, uh, fellow members of the, uh, of the committee who you'll be hearing from in commentary later in this, uh, in this time. And a special uh, thanks to the amazing staff uh, of the Academy that supported our work, uh, Eden Illman, Claire Stroud, uh, Chanel Matney, Katie Bowman uh, with us today, uh, Bridget Burrell earlier on. Uh, it's incredible staff and we really benefit from this work. We're excited about this report. We think it's important and we really welcome your, uh, your interest. I am Don Berwick. I'm a senior fellow at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, a former administrator of CMS, as you heard. I'm also a pediatrician. Uh, by training. Um, let me begin uh, with uh, a description of the, the, the group we had. Uh, our, our committee had 18 members, 17 colleagues of mine, uh, from multiple areas of TBI care and research. Our task was to identify uh, major barriers and knowledge gaps that would uh, need to be overcome to advance traumatic, traumatic uh, brain injury care and research in the United States. Uh, to identify opportunities to meet those challenges and then to provide a roadmap for progress. 
uh, to address this uh, task. We had uh, many committee meetings, also six public workshops and webinar sessions in which we heard from over 50 stakeholders and experts in TBI care and research, including, I'd say maybe most importantly, from people and families who were affected by a traumatic uh, brain injury. So let me briefly summarize the key messages of the report, then I'll proceed to, uh, to show you our recommendations, which number eight. Uh, first uh, key message, uh, traumatic brain injury should not be thought of as an isolated or a uh, simply an acute event. It's a complex, heterogeneous condition, many different causes, wide-ranging effects. It encompasses a, a, a range of severity of injuries from concussion to coma. While some people uh, recover from a traumatic brain injury within a few weeks, for other people, a traumatic brain injury can lead to a persistent, uh, longer-term picture, symptoms, and maybe even lifelong symptoms. This report emphasizes the role of what we call a biopsychosocio-ecological framework. That's a mouthful. We'll ex explain it for TBI care and research. So first message, TBI is not just an isolated event. It can and often is a lifelong condition. Second, we need a much more precise traumatic brain injury classification system to inform both patient care and research which draws on the state of scientific knowledge. We're gonna say a lot more about the classification system we need. Third, uh, the United States lacks a comprehensive framework for addressing TBI across the full care continuum. A lot of other conditions kind of have a home, uh, cancer, heart disease, stroke, and others. Um, TBI does not. We don't have a comprehensive national approach. And we heard painful testimony from people and families affected by TBI who felt unsupported after their um, or their loved one's injury, especially during the longer term phases of this condition and recovery. For many people, access to rehabilitation community services after traumatic brain injury remains a real challenge. So key message, we need a comprehensive framework for dealing with this, this uh, complex condition. Uh, fourth, a truly effective TBI care system would have to have the features of what the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine have called a learning healthcare system. That means a TBI system that would include features like access to high quality data, uh, processes for continual quality improvement, uh, processes for continual education and communication, and, and essentially partnerships among all the components of TBI care and with engaged patients and families. Uh, uh, connections to the range of professional and research communities involved and, and, and importantly, partnership among and cooperation among many federal agencies and private sector organizations. So we need to make TBI a team sport. Um, finally, progress has been made. We have a lot to celebrate. Uh, as a result of increased attention to, to traumatic brain injury over the past few decades. Uh, we understand a lot more about TBI and how it affects people over time. Uh, we have very valuable return to play and uh, return to duty protocols that have been implemented in sports and in the military. Uh, and research continues on care practices and support uh, to support recovery. We have a lot to celebrate, but TBI is heterogeneous, it's complex, and there's a variety of very, very important issues and questions that remain unaddressed. Uh, for example, the need to better understand why and how factors from details of the injury and comorbidities uh, affect TBI care. We need to understand the roles of biological sex, gender, race, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, insurance status, uh, and geographic location, how these interact to affect TBI recovery through this biopsychosocial ecological lens. And how can we use that knowledge to develop better and more effective treatments? Uh, there's a very wide range of communities that we have to involve. Communities, clinical communities, care settings, research fields, patient organizations, federal agencies, and other stakeholders that are relevant to traumatic brain injury. This, this poses significant coordination challenges, which leads us to the need for a framework that we're gonna be talking about. Uh, but it also is very exciting. It opens up tremendous possibilities for action as these partners work better together to improve TBI care and outcomes. We need to help that occur. Uh, we have in the report a lot of examples uh, about um, such opportunities in our recommendations, and I, I refer you to the report for that.
Now, just also to set the stage, let me just do a little review of uh, the background of TBI, uh, who it affects and, and how big the problem is. Well, TBI is a very common condition, much more common than I thought when I started uh, in this work with this committee. It can affect every segment of the population. It can result from sports injuries, from falls, from vehicle crashes, uh, military incidents like explosions, uh, interpersonal violence, uh, penetrating injuries like gunshot wounds, many other circumstances, and no population segment is exempt from the effects of TBI. Uh, the most recent estimates from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention report over 60 TBI-related hospitalizations and 17 and a half TBI-related deaths per 100,000 people in 2017. Uh, that means it's a public health issue with the highest rates of hospitalization and deaths occurring among older adults. Uh, these rates translate into uh, 224,000 hospitalizations, at least in the United States, and 61,000 deaths a year. And millions of people are evaluated for potential TBI in emergency departments and other settings each year. Uh, so TBI also poses significant health burdens on those who experience the TBI, on their families, on communities and on society. The costs don't just include direct healthcare, but also reduced quality of life. In some cases, impacts on families and communities through the need for ongoing family and caregiver support. We don't have a secure estimate of the full costs of TBI, but we estimate it to be about, to be as high as $750 billion a year for the roughly 2 million people who experience TBI uh, in, uh, in the United States every single year. Um, we use a lens in our analysis of needs which have to do with the patient journey. And I wanna just show you the phases here of TBI as a condition which helped guide our, our work. Um, traumatic brain injury begins with recognition that an injury has occurred. Uh, depending on the nature and the circumstances of the injury, a traumatic brain injury, like a concussion, it could be first recognized by an athletic trainer, by emergency responders, by a community member, or others. And, and frankly, for too much TBI, not recognized at all, as we'll talk about later on. The next step after recognition is for the person to receive acute care for their traumatic brain injury and any associated injuries. Uh, during acute care, an important focus is on stabilizing the person, and preventing or minimizing, mitigating further negative consequences from their injury. Acute care personnel are also going to seek to classify the nature and severity of the traumatic brain injury that's occurred through clinical evaluation, through imaging, and in other ways. And we're going to speak a lot to the need to reconsider, to redesign classification in this country. Uh, Rehabilitation interventions after traumatic brain injury can take many, many forms, uh, depending on the person's needs. For example, rehabilitation can include physical therapy, speech and language therapy, occupational therapy, many other kinds of interventions. And collectively, this rehabilitation care aims to improve a patient's function and quality of life uh, after traumatic brain injury. Um, Follow-up with a care system over time may also be important to enable ongoing assessment of a person's symptoms as they evolve and to make sure that care and, adjust, and uh, approaches are adjusted uh, as the patient's needs change. Follow-up is crucial. The goal after TBI is for the person to return to their previous level of health and function to the greatest extent possible, returning to their home, their community, and participating in activities like, like work or school. However, as the committee heard poignantly from patients and families affected, this care journey is not continuous or smooth for many people. A person may not have access to all the services that might benefit them, or they might lose access to care along the pathway and over time. Uh, the number of factors have been associated also with disparities in care, inequities in outcomes after TBI, including where someone lives, for example, Things can be quite different in a rural location, far from specialized trauma care or rehab services. Uh, we have inequities in rate, uh, according to race and ethnicity, and even whether the person's a civilian or a military service member, because the military has established special programs like the Veteran Administration's 
polytrauma system of care uh, for veteran service and service members affected by TBI. As I've said, some people will experience TBI as a chronic condition, and they're going to need long-term follow-up and rehab and other supports. And a person can experience more than one TBI in their lifetime. Uh, therefore, they'd be starting this pathway over with recognizing and then assessing the injury and needs. So let me proceed now to our recommendations, our eight recommendations. <laughs> Um, our, um, with, with these issues, the, the, the eight recommendations come out of the committee's discussions and, <coughs> excuse me, in the report, we try to identify for each recommendation specific actors, agencies, private sector professionals, uh, who we believe should be taking the lead in implementing the um, recommendations. <coughs> but let's keep in mind, TBI involves many different stakeholders. It's a complex condition. And so a lot of our recommendations have to do with partnership and coming together across boundaries. <clears throat> so our first recommendation is to update the classification scheme for TBI so that it's more precise, so that it aligns better with the state of scientific knowledge and takes advantage of new advances in areas like uh, imaging and biomarker. Uh, measurement. Um, these uh, developments are increasingly giving us much better ways to understand a person's injury and anticipate their tra trajectory and, and plan to help them. Uh, to take advantage of this knowledge, we need a new classification scheme. And our report calls on the National Institutes of Health specifically to convene a classification work group. It also calls on professional communities who diagnose and assess TBI to stop using the very blunt shorthand of mild, moderate, and severe for individual patients that no longer reflects the state of our knowledge. An important aim is to bring greater precision to TBI care and research in line with advances um, for what we know. If you wanna get the picture of what we're thinking, you wouldn't think today possibly of classifying cancer as mild, moderate, and severe. We know much too much about cancer to make that any longer a satisfactory way to talk about cancer. The same is true for a traumatic brain injury and it's time to reconsider classification. Mild is not always mild, severe can have much better outcomes than you would have thought. So recommendation number two, a traumatic brain injury needs to be managed not only as an acute injury, but also as I've said, as a potentially chronic condition for many people. Everyone who experiences a traumatic brain injury should have access to the care that they need along the full care continuum. And that does not always happen by any means. This includes a recommendation that everyone who experiences traumatic brain injury should receive the opportunity for a follow-up visit. Although many people who with so-called mild TBI will recover in a couple of weeks, many others are gonna to continue to report symptoms for much longer and we need to make sure that these people have a way to check back in. Again, we heard from patients and families that that opportunity does not by any means reliably exist. It's also important for healthcare organizations to be aware of a person's prior history of TBI and what types of accommodations they may need and to consider the needs of families and caregivers in longer term plans. Reframing TBI from just an acute condition to one with many, many chronic trajectories. Recommendation number three is that high quality traumatic brain injury care relies on having and using the best possible clinical care guidelines. We have many guidelines, but they're not harmonized. And we're calling for harmonization of care guidance and resolving inconsistencies among uh, different guidelines. Uh, high quality evidence, for example, from randomized clinical trials may not be sufficient, may be limiting for certain topics in which we really need care guidance. Uh, and so we need relevant federal agencies and professional communities to come together to consider how to identify and fill these gaps, not always with, with randomized trials, but with a, a much richer portfolio of ways of gathering and generating evidence. There's a reimbursement side to this. Uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and third-party healthcare payers, insurers, they need to be engaged in the development of the best practices for example, in, cri in criteria and coverage for rehab care. Coverage systems today do not by any means reflect 
reliably the best known science about the care that people actually need. Recommendation number four is that it's important to assure that clinical communities and the public are aware of the signs and symptoms of TBI, uh, the kinds of circumstances that can cause it, its prevalence as a significant health burden, and the resources that are available to help address TBI. Uh, awareness is a serious issue, and as my colleagues on the panel will, I'm sure, comment later, a lot of traumatic brain injury and its sequelae goes unrecognized due to lack of communication in public and professional awareness. Given the TBI significant impact, education and training programs for professionals who will encounter uh, and, and care for people with TBI need to include such information. Our fifth recommendation speaks to integration of care, a need to establish and support systems for delivering integrated traumatic brain injury care at the local and regional levels. If, as we said, traumatic brain injury is often a condition that extends over space and time through the lifetime in some cases, we need to address it that way. And we don't do that reliably. To help accomplish this, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services should support, we believe, the creation of pilot programs for integrated TBI care, possibly through the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, for example. Standards for high quality TBI care should be integrated into the assessment programs that we apply to organizations for trauma care, for post-acute and rehab care. For example, the American College of Surgeons uh, trauma accreditation systems, assessment systems should incorporate uh, standards for TBI care. Uh, and this should apply as well to the broad range of care settings, such as primary care and concussion clinics that serve people with TBI. These efforts uh, to develop local and regional integrated TBI care systems uh, should incorporate, should seek to incorporate where possible the lessons that have been learned from the Department of Defense and the Veterans Administration, which have developed a network of programs for integrated and specialized TBI care for military service members and veterans. We have a lot to learn what's happened from what's happened in DOD and the VA. Our sixth recommendation is a little bit inside baseball, but it's that the, the, the effective system for TBI care has, should have the features of what the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine have called a learning healthcare system. There's a decade of reports from uh, the academies on what the nature of a learning healthcare system is, and that should occur in the TBI world. A uh, learning healthcare system, for example, involves effective data infrastructures, uh, integrated data, including enhanced population level surveillance to understand patterns of TBI, uh, costs of TBI, outcomes of TBI, uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention can pay a play a key role here as can professional organizations. Uh, it also involves capturing very high quality patient level data. Uh, we believe the Health and Human Services Department should work with uh, electronic health records vendors and also with the owners of uh, several national and regional TBI registries already in existence to advance the ability to capture standardized information on patient records and to link those patient data's, data across settings including upstream to emerging, emergency medical services, pre-hospital care, and downstream to follow up and recovery, the full continuum of care for patients, a better data system for the purposes of learning. Recommendation number seven is about research. Uh, it emphasizes the importance of continued research to address TBI knowledge gaps, to strengthen the evidence base, and the need to invest more resources in TBI research, resources that would be commensurate with the enormous burden that TBI poses for our country. At the moment, our research investment is not commensurate with the level of uh, burden of traumatic brain injury. There is also a need to improve translation from basic and preclinical animal models, for example, to clinical care. That's challenging because of the nature of TBI and its uh, complex mechanisms of injury and physical, psychological, and behavioral sequelae and components, but this is important, translational um, research. And, and also to use uh, multiple types of high quality study designs. For example, not just randomized controlled trials uh, to, to use study designs that can be appropriate to help fill evidence gaps. And we're, <coughs> we're calling for the creation <coughs> of translational and implementation science centers to help advance this research 
integration and, and translation. In our report, for those of you especially interested in research, we have quite a, lo a long list of questions that need to be addressed, uh, research topics that need to be addressed. We have developed these eight priorities, not to the exclusion of others, but if you wanted to focus on eight priorities, these we think they could include the following. I won't go the, into them detail, but briefly, uh, uh, research to understand better the scope and burden of TBI. Uh, to understand uh, the economic impact of TBI, not just within healthcare, but within communities and families. Research to understand how combinations of injury characteristics, individual factors, socio-environmental factors affect uh, short, short and long-term care and outcomes. And to increase research on in inequity, on disparities uh, in TBI incidents, diagnosis, care and outcomes. We'd like to see more research on validated tools, especially the classification tools I mentioned earlier, and more research for evidence-based therapies to treat TBI. We have a lot more to learn. Uh, we need better designs for coordinating TBI care. What should a system of TBI care look like at an organization or regional level, for example? And we need to um, expand into areas related to TBI that have not been directly connected, quality improvement research, health economics research, and implementation uh, science research. Uh, again, we're seeking to make the investment in research commensurate with the size of the TBI issue in this country, and at the moment, it is not. Uh, finally, our eighth uh, recommendation, in some ways, I guess the, it, you could call it the most important, is that we need a framework, that, that a TBI demands a systemic approach, and we don't have one. And we need leadership to take a systemic view of TBI care and research, uh, to foster change, to bring together the many, many stakeholders and multiple lines of effort that I've mentioned that have to come together to optimize the TBI system and to oversee progress for reaching those goals. Where can such a integrated framework come from? Well, we have a suggestion. We are calling for a 10 year uh, traumatic brain injury task force uh, called together by the, through the leadership of the Department of Health and Human Services to bring together multiple agencies relevant to TBI, including HHS components, Department of Defense, the Veterans Administration, Department of Transportation, Social Security Administration, and more, which would in effect serve as a successor to the current uh, NRAP, the 10-year National Research Action Plan for TBI that is now uh, coming to its um, culmination. We think it's one of its first tasks, uh, such a task force convened by HHS, should release an implementation plan and should engage with public and private coalitions to advance this implementation. I would say implementation at both the national and the regional and local level. I want to mention that the uh, national academies are creating a forum for traumatic brain injury to provide an ongoing mechanism for the wide range of experts and stakeholders involved to come together to explore emerging issues and opportunities for collective action that will advance TBI research prevention and systems of care, a public-private combination, uh, including, I hope, important uh, and relevant uh, federal agencies. Uh, the National Academies are excited about this effort, and uh, I think they hope to announce the launch of this forum uh, soon, perhaps, perhaps this spring. Um, the, um, the report also, uh, creates a, 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 a set of tasks for various federal agencies and private actors that I won't review in particular, but we're trying not just to make recommendations, but to do what the military calls pin the rows on organizations and leaders who we believe uh, should step up and take responsibility for the recommendations. Um, that is the report in very brief. Uh, Stephanie, I'll return it back to you and my colleagues on the panel and I welcome a chance to have some dialogue with the uh, people attending. And again, thanks to those many of you who joined us uh, to address this important uh, topic. Great. Thank you so much. And just as a reminder for folks, if you have a question, you can type it into the chat box on the bottom of your screen. So our first question for you is, how can health professions associations engage in advancing the committee's recommendations? And how do such associations better engage with this committee, especially for those in the integrative health professions? 
Well, I'm going to turn to some of the panel members here to address that more specifically. Uh, I guess the most the thing I would say is the answer to your question is together that 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 this is not going to be yield to any single organization agency, uh, government agency or private sector. We have to have build bridges because this this condition is so tentacular. It really affects so many different people. But let me start. I'll start maybe with Jeff Manley, if you want to weigh in, Jeff, uh, and others of you who want to speak to this this issue of uh, how to involve uh, uh, professional groups in, in, the, in the next steps. Thanks, Don. And, and I think you highlight uh, really part of the challenge is that um, TBI is very multifaceted. There are multiple healthcare professional associations that uh, need to really come to the patient to help them to uh, uh, recover and, and reintegrate into society. And one of the things I would say is that, as you just mentioned, we are standing up a forum. And I know that there are a number of professional organizations and associations that have signed up for participation in this. And we see this as really the natural uh, continuation of the work that we've done over the last 15 or 16 months. Uh, as you said, this is a very tentacular problem and one in which we need multiple endpoints. So uh, we're hoping that this gets started up uh, in the spring or, uh, or early summer. And I think all organizations that want to participate should reach out to Andy Pope and they're, they're more than welcome to participate. We need everybody working together as a team. I think we can make a lot of progress in the next five to 10 years, but we're only going to do this by working together. Uh, General Schumacher has been a very strong advocate in the committee for multi-organizational involvement and partnership. Uh, do you want to speak to this a bit also, Eric? Yeah, I'd be happy to. <clears throat> Thanks, Don. And thank you for the question and for the robust participation of the audience that we've been watching. Um, I think the, the, the key is, uh, has already been stated by you, Don, and by Jeff, and that is um, it has to be done together. Uh, there, we need to get away from the notion that there's a single point of entry or a single point that needs to be leveraged here. This is um, a lifelong challenge to so many of our patients, unrecognized by so many, that goes all the way from the prevention side to the very end of rehabilitation reintegration in, in, into you know, meaningful life. And because as the, this wonderful diagram that has been put together by the staff illustrates, uh, traumatic brain injuries uh, along the whole spectrum can reoccur during the life of an individual. This can uh, be reactivated. And, and, and so we need everybody involved. The questioner had a specific question also about uh, the involvement, if I understand it, of the complementary integrative community. And I have a fair amount of experience with that, especially in pain management. And I can tell you that uh, much progress has been made, uh, number one, by securing the evidence of how these practices can impact um, overall Im improvement of quality of life for patients. And uh, the National C uh, Center for Complementary and Integrative Health has been really a, a, a great leader for that. And again, some of the emphasis on getting um, HHS and the NIH involved. And the other is that uh, developing consortia that integrate um, evidence-based practices in the complementary and integrative world um, in, into uh, uh, involvement in a multidisciplinary team-based patient-centered and community and family-centered approach, I think is, is one of the ways to go. But it has to be done together. It has to be, this is, this is a team sport. Thank you. Thanks, General. Um, Corey P. Casey, you may have some thoughts you wanna share on this. Yeah, I, I would like to share a couple of thoughts. And I first want to recognize that there are probably a number, maybe all of our panelists have some experience in this arena, personally with family in their professional setting as healthcare pro providers. So I think one thing that is really important is we see a growing grassroots movement of people prioritizing this issue and we need more voices in that arena. Uh, so we need champions. It doesn't mean we need, you know, everyone to go to the Hill or write op-eds, but we definitely need people just to talk about this more and create a buzz. So what feels like a very hidden experience can become part of our national discussion uh, and kind of urge like our report is trying to do uh, that there also are some top-down approaches that, that are helping move this forward. And I think that when we talk about together and thinking about restressing our biopsychosocial model, one thing that is a little different about traumatic brain injury than many other disease processes is the first symptoms are often reported outside of medical care. 
Uh, so we definitely need to involve our schools, our workplaces, um, our community organizations where people feel like they can trust someone to, to talk about their symptoms or what's happened to them. So I, I will say that we need you. <laughs> we need your voice. We need you to champion uh, the growth and prioritization and investment in reducing the burden of traumatic brain injury. Steffi, I know there are a lot of questions at Q, but on this particular point about community involvement, and the, the question was about professional involvement, but we're also talking about communities. And both Fred Corley and Jenny Bogner have spoken to that in committee uh, committee's work. Maybe, maybe you want to say a word about pulling in the community and the activism we, we could benefit from there. Sure. Um, thanks, Don. Um, you know, we, we do think that um, our agenda can only move forward, um, like everybody has said, if we have everyone contributing and, uh, and especially having contributions from patients and families from the communities, um, you know, making sure that uh, our Congress representatives and, uh, you know, those who can actually help us with uh, creating, you know, these uh, task force and you know, national care plans uh, that we need um, to move the field forward. Uh, you know, we wanna make sure that we, we get everyone engaged um, so we can be able to achieve you know, some of the recommendations we have mentioned in the report. Um, and in addition, uh, in terms of the professional societies, I think that if every professional society that, has, that is, does work um, in TBI, takes care of TBI patients, um, does work in TBI research. If you look through the recommendations, you're going to find uh, things that apply to you. And uh, from our standpoint in the emergency department, it's going to be uh, with improved recognition of traumatic brain injury, making the diagnosis, uh, the, the use of uh, you know, more descriptive uh, terms for classifying traumatic brain injury and so on, um, additional work to uh, uh, move forward um, diagnostics in terms of research and therapeutics. Um, and, and so there, there are things that, you know, every professional society, you know, can do um, to help achieve um, the objectives set forth and the recommendations set forth by the report. Thanks, Fred. Professor Bogner, do you want to make a comment before we move back to Stephanie? Sure. Um, it, it's already been mentioned a little bit here, but I want—I do want to emphasize, I mean, a lot of folks are going to be going up to the Hill in March. Take the report with you. Take a look at the report. See where it applies to your particular organization. And, and please um, start to pitch the, that aspect of the report. Um, a second point, just as an example, um, to kind of build off what Fred was talking about, um, from the standpoint of, of later care, rehabilitation care, chronic care, there's many places in that report where folks can be working together. Um, so for example, the uh, Administration for Community Living, the TBI model systems, American Congress of Rehab Medicine, American uh, Medical Rehabilitation Professionals Association, all of those organizations can be working with CMS to start to tackle some of those barriers that we're encountering to, se to sending people to inpatient rehabilitation, because so many of those barriers are, are based on the payment system and folks are ending up um, without the specialized care that they need. So, um, so we do need to work together to accomplish these goals. Thanks, Jenny. Um, we have a lot of questions, Stephanie, back to you, and we'll try to be prompt and quick to go through as many as we can get through now. Sure, absolutely. Um, the next one is, uh, did the report address specifically the unmet needs in pediatric TBI? Um, yes, it does. Uh, I'll invite any of the panelists that want to comment on the pediatric end to this. Uh, Corey, I believe you, you might want to say something about this. Yes, absolutely. And here again, going back to the biopsychosocial model, we need external partners. Uh, and so I think that we need everything across the spectrum. I'll talk about kind of first reporting and identifying symptoms, and then maybe go to Fred to talk about sort of intake and treatment and, and Jenny to talk about outcomes. Um, again, children are not going to be the the best ones to maybe always notice their symptoms. They might say something more offhand to a trainer or a coach or a, a someone. So we definitely need to sort of increase the level of, of readiness and preparedness to get to intake people into the systems. Um, and that is gonna involve a very large network of, of partners uh, in this work. Um, and we definitely have to also understand the long-term sequela 
uh, I noticed in the in the question and answers, you know, all kinds of things are coming up as as being at higher risk for people who've had especially a series of mild or more um, impactful traumatic brain injuries uh, that include everything from Alzheimer's to violence to Parkinson's to substance use. So they're both in the behavioral realm, but also in the more uh, sort of causal pathway of diseases, and we don't understand that yet. Uh, so I think both in the very short term and the very long term, we need to understand the the lifelong. Uh, progression of traumatic brain injury. Uh, Fred or Jenny, do you want to comment on the pediatric side of this? Sure, I can comment and say that uh, uh, throughout the report, you know, we do make sure we are paying attention to uh, concerns uh, with, the, with regards to uh, children and adolescents, uh, because, you know, this is a really important group that often actually gets re-injured um, and, uh, and similar to adults, you know, often gets undiagnosed. And, uh, and especially when it comes to, you know, some of the, the current gaps we have right now in terms of diagnosis, um, you know, the fact that uh, we use a lot of CT scans, you know, is often problematic, and especially uh, with uh, children. Um, as part of the report, we've highlighted things like, you know, novel um, discoveries in, uh, brain injury biomarkers, uh, which, which we need to uh, um, encourage uh, the adoption and the use uh, to help with uh, reducing unnecessary CT scans. Uh, you know, we, we call for the need for uh, additional funding into research uh, to help us uh, with uh, using some of these novel tools uh, to aid in diagnosis. You know, the current approval for uh, the brain injury biomarkers that may need to help with identifying who needs a CT scan or not. But additional research is needed um, to figure out if we can use these blood tests to help with uh, diagnosing uh, this condition, which is gonna be very relevant uh, to the pediatric population. And then I, I would just like to add that in, in addition um, to the patient themselves, we also need to be considering the families. Um, the families are, are provide very important support to the children who sustain a traumatic brain injury and to the adults and, and older adults as well. And yet uh, there's very, very little out there for the families in terms of providing them with support. We don't have the research that will improve um, family outcomes. And the family unit is, is often shattered by um, such an injury as this. So um, we really do need to be paying more attention to the families and providing them with the supports and the research that's needed to help them. Eric, it looks like you have a comment before we move. Yeah, I, I, and I wanna compliment the questioner. I think this is a really, really important uh, focus and it has been for several of our audiences be uh, before this talk. Um, it illustrates the, again, the what can potentially be a lifelong challenge uh, for a child that begins in childhood. Um, as a parent of, of children who skied and played contact sports like lacrosse and soccer and, um, and were skateboarders, I, I was always concerned about the culture of uh, neglect to the head injuries that they might be embedded within. But, uh, it also illustrates for many who have asked uh, about work-related um, uh, traumatic brain injury that we in the military discovered the majority of TBIs for our young soldiers, sailors, airmen, Marine Coast Guardsmen actually occurred before they entered service at age 18. So there's a burden of TBI that may be occurring throughout uh, childhood, adolescence, and young adulthood for those who are entering the service. And I saw one questioner just ask about the role of depression and PTSD and other comorbid conditions. We know that traumatic brain injuries, as Dr. Burwood said at the beginning, can occur in a whole variety of settings, natural disasters, violent crime, motor vehicle accidents, uh, and on the sports field. And many of those are associated with memories or experiences which provoke post-traumatic stress and if not address post-traumatic stress disorder. And they, they emerge oftentimes later in life when a re-injury occurs um, or they're exposed to circumstances that provoke those symptoms. So you're absolutely correct in asking about comorbidity of this. 
those childhood events uh, not infrequently are associated with other associated um, uh, injuries, psychological and otherwise, that carry on and linger uh, for a lifetime. Thank you. Thank you. Stephanie, back to you. Our next question is about surveillance of TBI, mortality, morbidity, and long-term outcomes. Are there data sources that are not being tapped to contribute to TBI surveillance? Let me ask Jeff to tackle that, and maybe Corey, if you could also weigh in. <clears throat> yes, I, I, I think that uh, through the course of our due diligence, we had the opportunity to speak with folks at the Centers for Disease Control, uh, and we were actually shocked at how little resources they have to capture what is a very important statistic to guide our work. And I think that uh, just due to our inability to diagnose traumatic brain injury, for example, uh, as Fred and others will say, uh, uh, you know, it's very hard to, to detect traumatic brain injury, particularly in an, uh, you know, an emergency department environment. So we desperately need uh, things for aid and diagnosis. So, so we really don't know the full scope of this problem. We think it's underestimated. Uh, the agency that has been uh, pegged to help us with this, I think currently is underfunded, and that's my personal uh, opinion based upon my discussions. Uh, but I uh, would be curious to see what Corey thinks about this, because she spent her entire career really looking at this and, 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 and very carefully uh, um, uh, highlighting where uh, these major gaps are in our ability to describe this problem. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. The report very clearly identifies two large wings where we need to invest in, in better information. One is in surveillance, understanding how frequently uh, traumatic brain injuries occur and how many people in the population are living with consequences from a traumatic brain injury, incidents and prevalence as we call them. Um, and then we also need to invest in systems that really dive deep into what are the clinical factors, what are the causal factors, uh, what are the outcomes. And those may be two different systems, but I will say that we are experiencing a real great day for uh, health informatics and the platforms, the ability to gather data has never been broader. Uh, but what we are lacking is the uh, indicators in those databases that help us understand what we need to understand about traumatic brain injury. So for example, it's difficult to figure out who died from a traumatic brain injury on the death certificate because if you die in a car crash, it's gonna say multiple blunt injury, not traumatic brain injury. So we may be underestimating deaths by as much as 20%. Uh, so the, it's more specifically to the answer to the question, yes, there are absolutely great data systems that are highly protected under our cybersecurity laws that can be used, but we need two things to improve them. Uh, both that will require some both prioritization and some investment. One is that we need to get the traumatic brain injury indicators and we need research to help us understand what are those poor indicators. Uh, and the second is that we need to be able to link those systems. Uh, we need some cross ways that we can uh, not only help the patient get from acute care to long-term care, but get their uh, electronic medical record and data path uh, to follow as well. The question also echoes in individual patient information. Uh, I was stunned uh, through this report to learn how, how often the patient is lost, lost to follow up, not followed up. Uh, a remarkably small percentage of people actually get into rehab care uh, who might benefit from it. I think Jenny has some data on that. Um, but um, the, there's definitely data that we could, if we work at it, integrate. I think the military and the VA have done, uh, have set a lot of that pace in, in place and we have models. Jenny, what's the statistic on proportion of people who actually do get followed up? There's thir 13 to 25% of folks actually end up receiving the specialized inpatient rehabilitation care that they need. So folks with moderate and severe traumatic brain injury, um, many, many, many of those folks end up not getting the specialized care they need. They end up going home, or they end up going to nursing facilities, and largely that is because of barriers created by our payment systems. Thank you. Stephanie? Our next question is, shouldn't we create a new validated classification scheme before we abandon the mild, moderate, severe shorthand? Yeah, that's important, important question. So uh, we, um, I'm going to let the experts speak to that. So Fred Corley and Jeff Manley, if you'd speak about 
how we should transition from an inadequate classification system to a, to a much more sophisticated one. Fred, you wanna start and then Jeff? Sure, uh, thanks Don. Um, so right now, you know, we, we use mild, moderate and severe um, as categorizations of the Glasgow comma scale. And, uh, and I think if, if we do nothing at all, uh, you know, we need to start actually using the raw uh, Glasgow coma scale score. Um, so that instead of, you know, saying a patient um, has mild TBI, if they're GCS 15 TBI, you say they're GCS 15 TBI. If they're GCS 13, you say they're GCS 13, uh, because we think that, you know, that um, it's more descriptive um, than just lumping the two together because, you know, for all of us who take care of these patients, you know, we do know that, you know, having a GCS of 15 versus having a GCS of 13, you know, uh, they mean completely different things. And uh, it's not particularly fair uh, to the GCS 13 patients, you know, to lump them together with someone who has a GCS of 15. Um, in addition, you know, the majority of our patients are getting CT scans. And I think it's really important that we go ahead and, you know, start uh, incorporating uh, CT findings, which, you know, we already have um, into the description of uh, a patient's condition. Um, and uh, as the majority, some may be aware, um, last year, the FDA approved the use of uh, brain injury biomarkers uh, that can be uh, measured um, on a point of care instrument um, um, for helping with uh, figuring out who needs a CT scan. So we're gonna have people who have the results of these brain injury biomarkers. And uh, it will be important that once we start using these, uh, we can uh, use them to also just describe a patient's um, condition. Because we think that you know, having this sort of description um, would um, help inform you know, the diagnosis, help inform the next steps as to what needs to be done and uh, give us a sense of you know, the prognosis. Um, so you know, we can you know, better counsel patients on uh, what to expect from the injuries. Jeff. Thanks, Fred. Remember, we do specifically call on NIH promptly to really convene this uh, task force on classification to get over the problem of questions about. Jeff, what would, how would you counsel people who are yeah. a little concerned? Well, what I would say is, is that you know, Fred brings up some great points. And uh, the, the GCS was never intended to, to have this simple shorthand of mild, moderate, or severe. And this actually creates a lot of bias and I think injury to patients. So when we call somebody mild and they're not back to work at a year, uh, th that is not a mild injury. We also call patients severe, where we've had recent publications that suggest that there's far greater potential for these patients to recover. And we're actually withdrawing life support early because of our bias towards a severe TBI, when in fact, uh, our rehab colleagues have been telling us for years that these patients have a much greater potential to recover than we've ever believed. So the terms themselves are actually harming patients. ACRM is coming up with uh, the, the, the new uh, definition for TBI. Uh, it'll be the first one in 30 years that incorporates things like imaging and blood-based biomarkers. And I think that we have information in front of us now to do a better job. There's been tons of research that's been funded by the European Commission, by the NIH, by the DOD, by the Canadian uh, Institute of uh, Research, where we have a lot of data that would suggest that simply referring to a patient's GCS, as Fred said, 13 is very different from 15, describing when available imaging findings, describing when available blood-based biomarkers, it, it's really an idea of first creating a diagnosis, head injury, yes or no. And I think the ACRM is gonna go a long ways and then actually describing it, as you've pointed out, Don, just to simply say that somebody has severe cancer, we're never gonna have a treatment for that. But if I say that somebody has a GCS of seven with a large epidemic dural hematoma and a, a blood-based biomarker of X, I can tell you already that that's probably a patient that needs surgery that can lead to a meaningful recovery. So we already have the information to do this. We just need to collate it. And then over time, just like with cancer, you know, 20 years from now, we're going to have very detailed mechanistic endophenotype descriptions of these, of these injuries. But in the meantime, Calling somebody mild and calling somebody severe isn't always in the patient's best interest. And that's really what we're here for, is for the patients. Jeff. Stephanie, back to you. 
This is going to be a little rapid fire. We probably have room for two more questions. So let's talk about disparities. Um, lack of attention to social drivers, structural racism, inequities, and bias all play a role in poor access to quality TBI care and in particular rehabilitation and longer term follow up care across lifespan. Um, how do we make sure we take action in research policy and care? And uh, someone else also raised the question, um, what approaches do you think would be helpful in increasing rural health workforce capacity to diagnose and treat TBI? Um, welcome any panelists to weigh in, maybe starting with you, Eric and Corey. Um, I would say, uh, as for all issues of equity nowadays, uh, stratifying data so that we actually can begin to study much more detail what the relationships are between uh, race, ethnicity, and other, um, other uh, stratifications that will help us see inequity when it's there. Uh, but Eric, I know you're concerned about this, Corey, and any any of others that you please weigh in. We, we only have a couple minutes, so. Uh, yeah, I, I, and I think we were struck as well by the fact that there is there is uh, so much inequity when it comes to access to some of the existing um, diagnostic and and treatment and rehab uh, protocols that are available at centers where we have so-called positive deviance. We have good regional and sub-regional networks developing that can serve as um, exam exemplars of how this can be done well, but access is limited in many, many uh, parts of the country, rural being one of them. Uh, the, the presence of structural racist uh, uh, and institutional racist um, legacy systems that exist even in inner cities has limited access. And I think uh, one of the more compelling uh, quotes that we include in the, in the report came from um, a, an expert in the rural environment who said, uh, too often uh, where you live determines whether you'll live from one of these injuries. And I think that really seized all of us uh, immediately that we, we don't see, um, uh, a country, uh, a nation which um, has so much potential and as uh, Corey and others have spoken to with some uh, immediate changes could uh, alter outcomes for so many people. We just don't see um, uh, why this can't be overcome uh, with, with a, um, you know, a consensus approach, a team approach. Thank you. And I would say that for under-resourced communities and for communities of color, it's kind of a triple whammy and that the structural racism Eric talked about has led to geospatial concentrations of lack of resources that often also have higher risks for traumatic brain injury. <clears throat> so there's a pre-event issue. Um, I think that there is good evidence that under-resourced communities and communities of color have um, a, a good reason to have some lack of trust in the healthcare system and under-resourced populations are also under-resourced in the type of care that's covered for them. Uh, and I think in rural environments, just you know, the spatial concentration of how emergency medical services get to you, get you to a hospital, how long it takes to, definitive, to get to definitive care are, are really daunting. Uh, and I think that, again, going back to the biopsychosocial model, it's gonna take a lot of partners. One is that we have to create some equity in the system as a whole, but we also need to address this very specifically in traumatic brain injury. Uh, and again, a regionalization, a coordination, and an investment in prioritization are the large steps that we need, but we also need uh, help from individuals to, to get their voices heard. Um, and I think that what I can say from this panel, at least, is that we are listening. We are trying, and we are trying to, to spread the, the listen. We have room for one last question. You've touched on this, but I do think it is really important to raise again. Uh, what are some of the interventions specific to family caregivers and advocates? Thanks. Uh, Jenny, do you want to take that one? There, there, we don't have a lot of research on that yet. That's really what we need to be increasing is, is increasing the research that we can um, that will improve outcomes for the families and ultimately improve outcomes for society. So that is one of the things that are, that's being called for in the report. A lot of the hidden cost of uh, TBI 
it lies in this case that the families and carers are, are putting a lot of time into dealing with issues, some of which may exist and not even be understood to be attributable to the TBI. So it's a really important area for further research and, and I think a lot of support. And I wanted to add one other thing is that is that you know there is money available through the TBI Act, the Traumatic Brain Injury Act, to bring money for states to apply to bring more money to the states so that they can be improving their ability to address the, the needs of families and patients, persons living with traumatic brain injury in their communities. Right now, there's only about 16 states that have, have accessed that, that money consistently. And if that, those funds were increased and if states were able to um, access those funds more readily, then I think we can start to improve um, uh, the services that can get out to the families and to people who are living in the rural communities, um, as well as the states as a whole. You know, Don, I, I have to comment too that, that just remind people that um, this is not all within the realm of the highly specialized medical care system, that the majority of traumatic brain injuries that occur in the country are really on the spectrum on the lesser side. And we made, we made a, a, a great inroads into cardiovascular disease death, into early recognition of cancer and the like through public education and engagement of the public uh, in taking sometimes very simple steps to recognize and um, um, take aggressive action when um, these, could, these uh, traumatic brain injuries occur. We in the military, the sports community, has, has really taken this on. So care at the point of injury on the sports field or on the battlefield or, and frankly, for, for members of the services, it's, it's motor vehicle accidents and sports injuries, just like it is in the private sector. Um, so the public's engagement at that level, parents' engagement at that level, friends and, and family, I think are very, very important for, uh, for uh, turning the curve on on disability, long-term disability from, from these concussive and other events. Thank you all for being so generous with your time. I know we're um, a little past the hour and I apologize if uh, you had submitted a question and we didn't get to it. But the good news is once you exit this webinar, you'll be redirected to our report page where you could download a free PDF and several other summary materials um, on the report. Um, so thank you again for um, to our panelists and our participants and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you all.